It's a real pleasure for me to be back at MIT. I started my career at uh, the Artificial Intelligence Lab at Texas Instruments. And we were one of the first ones to commercialize an AI machine or a Lisp machine that was uh, first developed at MIT. And I remember the early days when you were taking AI to large enterprises and you hid the AI in it because it would be too geekish. And uh, right now, we're all coming out of the closet. And it's a, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And I'll talk about how to make an uh, enterprise platform have similar kind of experiences that executives are now having with their consumer devices, right? Uh, one of them was that um, Google always surprises me. And one of them was, hey, you need to leave 15 minutes earlier. How did you know? I didn't tell you. I didn't put it on my calendar. Well, uh, they checked uh, my, I guess, text message and put it on my calendar somewhere. My, I must have okayed that. And, <laughs> but for millions of users, they checked. So they must have put an alarm. And they check. And it's not super intelligent, but to do it at the kind of scale that they are, is quite impressive, and that's one of many small examples, right? And executives are noticing this, and they're challenging their own IT staff as to why can I go and find more information about my company on Google than I can in my own enterprise systems, <laughs> right? So I'm going to try to answer that question as to what needs to be done. In other words, I'm going to talk about what an incumbent can do. And, uh, to, and like many of the, the speakers that I notice come after me, to be able to learn from what the platforms are doing exceedingly well. In summary, they are much more flexible, both to market changes and supply changes. Right? They're not that fixed. And the question is, what can incumbents do to make use of their inherent advantage, and they have quite a few, in their intellectual property, in their plant and equipment, in their distribution channels, et cetera, and mix it with what's to be learned from the uh, platform companies that Peter introduced this morning. And I'm going to talk about the core technology to make that happen. So again, a few basics. This is what's very frustrating about all talks you go to. For 15 minutes, they tell you things that you already know. And then by the time it comes to talking about the magic sauce, time is over. <laughs> but, but it's kind of important introduction. And one of them is that the variability and complexity in business is going up extremely rapidly. I won't bore you through all the examples. You know most of them. but. Uh, growing non-traditional competition like Airbnb is to a hotel chain is becoming really common where they're using existing capacities much more intelligently, but they have many other capabilities that are much superior that I'll talk about. But change is coming very rapidly, and so it whole thing is about being more agile. So it used to be like you used to drive on roads that were straight, and you were driving 10 miles per hour. If you look at the predominant management method in large companies, it's driving by looking at the rear view mirror. You don't have much forward visibility. You don't need it because the road's going to go straight. And you're going pretty slow on it. But when you're driving 200 miles per hour on a road that curves, you need a completely different technology, one that platforms are mastering. And it's pretty important for the corporations to be able to mix that kind of capability. And that's what I'll talk about. So main thesis is you need a 100-fold increase, both in the speed and quality of decision making. Of course, the 100-fold is very scientific. You can ask me for an ex explanation later. And I'll be uh, glad to uh, try dying or die trying. Um, there are many examples which my current company is working with right now. For example, uh, a lot of focus was on internal optimization. But we're working with Bridgestone Tire now. And a lot of value comes from Bridgestone telling its retail customer what assortment of tires to keep 
in which region, depending on the population. For example, the change that they're facing is that when gas prices drop, Californians continue to buy the Priuses and the hybrids, while my uh, friends in Texas start moving to SUVs because gas is cheap. Right, So detecting that trend such that your assortment is correct, you're not, you haven't made the wrong kind of tires and shipped them to uh, the wrong area is just one simple example. But these kind of decision-making opportunities where the company is adjusting faster to outside market change, and thus the optimization and the resource orchestration is not just within your four walls. It's in the entire ecosystem, starts becoming really important. Now, borrowing from uh, the work of speakers who are going to follow me, uh, uh, they really nail this fairly well in this slide, talking about the difference between a conventional corporation and a platform strategy. A platform strategy, one that's really important for the conventional corporation, right? So we talked about the focus on internal optimization, for example. That is not much use. Not only is it not much use, it's something they really didn't do very well, right? Which corporation did internal optimization well? Because there were silos within the company itself. So the silos were optimized. The company was barely optimized. And when you talk about optimized, it's in relationship to what? It's the market. It's what the consumer wants. Now, if you have a large factory that makes sulfuric acid and you keep making sulfuric acid, yeah, you can do a lot of internal optimization and you can get better and better at that, uh, particularly. But if you talk to a sulfuric acid manufacturer, they will also talk about the grades that need to change and how the demand is changing, the region in which the demand is changing. They're also this very significant change. Okay. So we'll talk about resource orchestration, what technology is required to do broad sale resource optimization across the ecosystem. Again, borrowing from uh, the work uh, of uh, 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 the book on platform strategy. So existing companies are more like pipelines. And when you think about the pipeline, you think about the pipeline of the supply chain and the pipeline that does the demand supply matching, right? If you think about any platform, whether it's Amazon, Uber, et cetera, what's the primary function? It's demand supply matching. And how well you do it is where the magic sauce is. Now, so silos of capability are well known. But what I want to emphasize, it's the silos of knowledge within the company. The silos of knowledge and the silos of command and control and unfortunately, the silos of knowledge uh, and the silos of command and control are different. The people making important decisions don't really have the knowledge, right? And platforms are changing it because it's all a network. The right information is coming to the right person. And the right person with the knowledge has the ability to collaborate with decision makers. And there's much more iteration in being able to make a better decision, OK? Now you're waiting, so how do I do this? How do I do this? Well, that costs a million dollars. <laughs> no, I will get to that. So but let's again talk through the basics. The basics is, so what's the fundamental difference? What are the platforms good at that an incumbent or a conventional company needs to copy? First is demand shaping, many examples of that. For example, in uh, Airbnb, the pricing is done by the homeowner, right? So if I need to shape demand, my prices are out of whack. Within two months, I know. I start changing them. I don't need to go to committee and finance authorization of the price change. And somebody's arguing about what the margin now is based on the price, right? And cost allocations. Right? That decision is very simple. And so demand shaping becomes really a big advantage where you're continuously doing it. It's not that conventional corporations don't do it. Who does demand shaping really well? It's the airlines, right? It's a great example. Hotels do too. They're demand shaping continuously. So it's not unknown to them. But again, uh, they were compelled into doing that. And you know how long it took an airline to do that? 
Uh, one of the brilliant rules and in, uh, inventions was a Saturday night stay over fair, right? But I really think of it, if I was a pilot, a distributed operator, I would have figured that out, that hey, on Saturdays, there's not many people coming and business people need to go back home on a Friday, so let me have a Saturday night stay over fair, and I would have figured it out. But people did figure it out in airlines, to implement it took a long time, and that's the challenge. But I won't bore you with the details. Supply shaping is another thing. Uber does it really well, for example. When the demand is high, they increase the fares, and more drivers come to work because they're going to make more money. Simple but powerful example. This is possible to some degree in a regular supply chain because if you give incentive, then a supplier will increase supply. They will air freight it instead of ground transport it. So there are many, many degrees of freedom that are not properly utilized, okay? Then frictionless demand supply matching is very key. I think one of the previous talk, uh, speakers talked about how you should not need an army of salespeople to do the supply demand match, right? And it should be pretty important, not just the matching, but the fulfillment. It can be more automated. There are businesses where you need a person, but uh, I know many corporations where when the customer demand comes up, just Making them a proposal, getting the configuration right, takes one week. You could get it done in half an hour if you had proper decision management tools. To get it approved takes four weeks, and you could get it approved in another half an hour if you had the right collaboration technology, and you bought the right information to the dis decision managers, and you had the right dispute resolution where uh, everything was there, but the magic really is, where technology can provide, is the review of decisions, right? It's a post-game analysis later to say, did we make a smart decision, right? Just like a sports team watches a video and says, oh my god, I could have made that play better. Corporations are not doing that well. Corporations do have post-game reviews, and we call them this. It's a blame game as compared <laughs> Uh, as compared to a real problem solving, a culture of continuous learning, and the data is really poor. Anyone can justify their position, and the position is justified by what it means to my comp plan, right? Uh, so that's the continuous learning part I'm talking about. Visibility and collaboration is pretty self-evident. The last part is not unimportant, which has been pointed out by several authors as they're talking about platform advantages, is the ability to add new services, right? So there's a demand supply match engine running. It's a big corporation or it's an Uber. On Uber, for argument's sake, if I wanted to start a food delivery service on it, then I should be able to add that service without Uber's permission as an app and be able to use the Uber framework to be able to do that. Now, there are many things entrepreneurs would like to do with large corporations, with their existing infrastructure, which is hugely beneficial to the corporation if they allow me to add apps to it. Right, And uh, so that's a big opportunity in innovation. So now I laid out the problem for you. Now I'm going to move towards the solution. But you still have to pay a million dollars to know the right answer. <laughs> so now I'll start introducing the basics again. This is nothing new. When you want to drive fast on roads that are really uh, uh, mountainous, then you need the following three capabilities. Whether you're pipelined or networked, whether you're an incumbent or you're a platform, you need to know what's happening and why. In everywhere, in demand, in weather, in consumer patterns, where is a population more affluent? Is the affluence growing? What does it mean to their buying pattern for me? In supply, in my own factory, I'm having such 
quality problems here, so I'm going to have delivery issues, right? So it's what's happening and why, what will happen, which is forecasting, et cetera. And in what will happen, usually a company is lucky to have one scenario. You need multiple scenarios. What if the winter is stronger? Last winter, for example, was very strong in the West Coast. It was not on the East Coast. And people had extra winter clothes, all uh, manufacturers and retailers, too much extra winter coats on the East Coast, and you were out on the West Coast. Highly avoidable problem, not completely defeatable, but your performance could be 50% better easily if you had managed that scenario and pre-planned what you're going to do in that scenario. And even if you hadn't pre-planned and the scenario started hitting you, if you were the first to know what's happening and why, what's happening is my inventory of jackets is going up in East Coast. It's going down in uh, West Coast, why? Why is the difficult part? That's what requires a cognitive engine. Otherwise, it's very hard to do. That's what requires a network, because even if you don't have AI in your system, if you build a collaboration framework, somebody is going to tell you. A store operator, a store retail store manager will tell you, hey, we're freezing out here and there are no jackets, right? So you bring that information, and um, then you go to the most important step, what should we do? It's traditionally called planning. Now there's a problem with corporations and planning. Corporations rarely do planning. What happens is I'm, use, I'm working right now with a large corporation. It's roughly a $12 billion uh, company. Their annual operating co uh, plan takes about four months to build. It is crazy, and if you look at the process, it's largely a negotiation process, it's not a planning process. Because various people are negotiating on how they should present a number and be given a number such that they can exceed the comp plan, right? And uh, so the what should you do has a lot of opportunities culture change wise and technology wise. But I think these companies are so large that technology is really important to drive the culture change. One cannot come before. One of the big fallacies we still see is that we go to a corporation and we start talking to the executives. They say, I see this. Let's first work out our new processes. Once we have our new processes worked out, then we'll implement the technology. Does not work that way. The technology is fundamental part of the culture change. It's so important part of our existence right now. You can't design a new process which is not taking technology into account or not using what strengths the technology gives you. It's like planning a battle without knowing what new kind of aircraft I have or new kind of surveillance systems I have. And I'm going to plan a completely different battle if I'm going to fight with swords. Do you know what the uh, decision management swords of a corporation are? It's called Excel. <laughs> Actually, there are three swords. For quantitative data, it's Excel. All the assumptions are in a PowerPoint. Because if I'm looking at a data, I want to click on it and say, hey, you're saying so many jackets. What's the weather assumption for the West Coast? Right? Well, that might be, if you're lucky, in a PowerPoint. And then where does the collaboration occur? Email, right? Now I talked about the three questions. We call them the three Ws. They're fundamental to converting a company into a platform. So if you had a measurement of what is the rate of journey of a company, you say, how good are they getting at the three Ws? That's principally it. And then uh, three disciplines is a no surprises culture. Which means that if I were working for you and I said I'll sell 100 of these and I sold only 80, what's the question you'll ask me? Anyone? What happened? Da -da, da -da, da -da. What's the root cause? No, 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 no. All those are good questions. The most important question is when did you first know? By the way, I had the answer for you there. <laughs> <laughs> I am so smart, aren't I? No, I'm joking. Uh, uh, 
it's uh, when did you first know? So we are driving this when did you first know culture into corporations. For that, a platform becomes necessary. Fact-based decision making, I won't say much about it. It's pretty obvious. It has been obvious 30 years ago. So the question is, why not? And now the technologies are becoming available to get us closer and closer to that. And continuous learning that I talked about, that is really critical to intelligence. Any form of intelligence that's demonstrated, whether a ch child learning to walk or learning a new language, it's continuous learning. You make mistakes, you understand those, and you bring them into your next planning. Right, So continuous learning needs to be an important part, and it's very good in the platforms. The platforms like Netflix, for example, are understanding what you've been watching and what it means. And a corporation, most of that knowledge is in people's heads. It's not that salespeople, product managers, et cetera, don't understand what's happening at the customers. They are understanding customers' buying habits. But first, the amount of data is too large for any one person's head. And it needs to be uh, spread across the corporation to be made useful. And it being in people's heads or in the three planning tools, the spreadsheets, PowerPoints, and email is not adequate. So continuous learning is not possible without a new generation platform. OK, so I already talked about it. So the primary problem is that most useful knowledge is in people's heads. Uh, so let's say I'm dealing with an example, which I sell sunglasses and caps. If I put sunglasses on sale, caps, the demand goes up, right? Makes sense. Maybe uh, it's summer and people are coming buying sunglasses. They buy caps also. But there could be an exception. It only happens in affluent regions. And in non-affluent regions, when I put sunglasses on sales, cap sales actually goes down because people can't afford to buy both. right? So. Uh, that kind of knowledge is not there, and sometimes it's not even there in people's heads. And all the important knowledge is in silos. Many times when I've been doing these decision support systems for years, the number one question people ask me, and it was asked here also, where do you get the data from, ERP systems? No, ERP systems have not much interesting data. We talked about all the interesting data is outside. What's the weather? Who's buying jackets? What's the correlations? ERP systems were supposed to deliver the inter integrated enterprise. They did not. They did deliver huge value in integrated transaction management systems, uh, all the way from placing a purchase order or taking a customer order, and it reflecting in your financials. Extremely useful. It used to take two months to close books, and now you can close your books in half a day if you're set up correct. Now, uh, moving towards the million dollar answer. Again, this is a boring chart, but the value of this chart is what I'm going to now tell you. Right? So there are many planning systems. They exist in a company. Uh, let's take the sales planning system. A sales planning system, I said I'm going to sell 100 of this. What kind of capabilities do I need? Is It has to be a full closed loop system that says, hey, I'm going to sell 100 of these. Then we said, when did you first know was really important? So just in that bucket, I need to start nailing. Say 100 was the plan for the month. First week, how much did I sell? Maybe I should have sold 25, and I sold only 10. What's happening and why? Why it's happening is that the competitor has better pricing. Now, if I don't change my price, what's going to happen in the next three weeks? right? And based on what's going to happen, what should I do? Should I drop my price? Or should I move my product to another region? Or anyway, one component that was going into that product was short, and I can now assign it to another product where I have better margins anyway, and I'm actually gaining share. So many of those things need to be done. So all these engines that we talk about for the next generation platform have to be very good at answering the three questions, the three Ws. But 
they cannot do them independently. First, we are saying, hey, build any one of these engines and make them good, a closed loop, continuous learning, fact-based decision making, early detection of problems. Then collaborate with the others, which is sales planning cannot be done without knowing what the promos are, what the marketing programs are, nor can it done, be done without understanding new product introduction plans that may come from the product portfolio plans, nor can it done, be done without supply chain planning, right? Because I have to fulfill. So all those need to be linked together, but that can be your second stage. Moreover, this is not replacing your existing planning systems in an incumbent that would be extremely hard to do. It's a layer over existing capabilities, which is bringing intelligence. So it is the cognitive decision management layer. It's adding to those things that people corrected on their own. Despite there being a very detailed supply chain system, people brought the data into spreadsheets and manipulated that. It's the intelligence layer, and it's the collaboration layer. It's the continuous knowledge management layer. So on one side, I have market intelligence there, working with separate pockets of planning. On the top, I have integrated business planning, things like sales and operations planning, or annual operating planning, where I'm integrating them, but at a more granular level. No, sorry, a more aggregate level. The detail plans are at a more granular level. But more importantly, I have a performance management thing, and the post-game analysis there is really important, where what really happened? What were my wrong assumptions? What correlations did I not understand? And what correlations become important in the future? So when you look at a number, you can see not only what the assumptions behind it are, but if I said I'm going to sell 100 of this, you could click on it. And this was a design that was given to us by one of our CEO customers who said, I want to click on the number and I want to know where, what various people are saying. And why not get those things voted such that I know what most of my organization thinks that's going to happen. Generally, when there's a bogus forecast like 100, there are a lot of people in the organization who already know that either you're going to be selling 150 or you're going to be selling 50, right? And um, last slide that I'm going to cover is the underlying magic sauce or what technology layer is needed to make a cognitive decision support platform that supports the functionality that I talked about in the last page that supports the answering of a three questions just like the platforms do. The magic sauce is in what we call as a knowledge model. A knowledge model is missing in a company where a knowledge that I talked about where when I promote sunglasses, this is the correlation to caps in these regions, in these zip codes. That being just one example, there are many such examples of knowledge that needs to be represented. And that knowledge makes the core magic sauce. On that knowledge, you need computational models that are important to the company. We said, I need to now forecast, right? But I need the knowledge to be able to forecast. I need to calculate the economic benefit of one scenario versus another. The knowledge needs to be correct to be able to do that. But the computational engines, if they're not there, then the knowledge is not much use. Then there needs to be a collaboration layer. And I won't have much time to talk about the basics of that, but existing collaboration layers, such as Slack, et cetera, that are becoming very popular, or a collaboration system that an SAP provides is highly inadequate, mainly because it does not understand the corporation. An intelligent collaboration layer needs to understand the basic knowledge and how the business of the corporation is done in the entire ecosystem. Once that there, magic happens and a lot of new knowledge starts getting collected and uh, the platform builds very successfully. So I'm going to stop there.
So that's fascinating. Um, and I think it really dovetails with what we heard earlier today um, from Janelle on the importance, again, of mobilizing the developer community because you're talking about helping firms allow others to get access to information and then having it all better integrated. So I guess my question then is, what have you got in place to kind of help those external parties as well as all the work that you're clearly doing at the enterprise? Yeah, again, uh, it's a very difficult answer, question to answer in a short time because it's example by example. Once you have the knowledge model, you have to understand what parts of the knowledge model do you want to expose to other parties such that they can creatively add value to the corporation. Essentially, if I order a bunch of six packs of a drink from my supplier, and they don't have six packs, but they have 12 packs, they usually won't ship me that. They'll only say, hey, I can't ship you the six packs. But if my knowledge model exposed them to my inventory levels, and somehow the supplier can figure out that I can give 12 packs uh, right now to fulfill the demand, that's the innovation you want in the ecosystem. So it all starts by exposing the knowledge model to the right players, either on the supply side or on the customer side, such that innovation and contributions of that side are possible. The knowledge model is very key to that. Thanks, I'm Bruce Hecht from Analog Devices. I was curious to know in this model, um, how would you see it uh, more likely to evolve or what's been your experience? Would it be more uh, the case that you might find uh, places to apply it, so one part of the enterprise? Or is it more a question of looking at the enterprise as a whole? Or does it depend on what's the goals that you're trying to go after? Right, so I'll give you examples. We're working with Asian Paints in India, which is a big paints company. They use my previous company, i2 Technologies, supply chain software. And for a long time, we had a view that the uh, issue is they have about 40,000 distribution points in India. And one of the things we wanted to collect is what the distributor knowledge is. Right? So we built only a portion of this platform, which is being used by the sales teams to do sales planning and work with the 40,000 distribution point. But they're bringing the knowledge back into the supply chain. For example, if I had to sell 10 of these and I sold only five, I tell the supply, uh, distributor, hey, why did you sell only 10? Your competitor's having a promo or your white paint doesn't work in my region. The moment they put that data, we can parse it, we can figure out, ah, they're talking about white paint. Who else in the corporation needs to know about white paint? What's the issue with white paint? Because the tags are now intelligent and they're uh, connected to the data model. So to answer your question, yeah, we start small. Anywhere in the previous chart, we take one area. Sales and operations planning is a typical area we start with because it connects a lot of the corporation. Demand planning is another area we start with. So generally, we're starting with one area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. One, uh, only one more, sorry. Uh, I can talk to you guys later. <laughs> Hi, Patrick Carrick with Culture Hub. Um, thank you, by the way, it was a great speak, uh, speech. But I wanted to ask, what are the issues that cause from uh, creating an environment like this, what issues have come up with creating sustainability within that e decision-making ecosystem? You know, do people not necessarily want to go back to the old ways, or you know, what have you experienced to keep that type of collaborative uh, spirit you know, fostered? I think this is a question that somebody asked Sam Parmesano on what's the challenges for an incumbent to move uh, to a uh, platform-like solution, and the change management there is quite big. He talked about one issue, mainly for sake of time, which was the revenue recognition part, but there's several others. The basic thing is that uh, people in corporations are extremely busy. They're already overloaded. All resources, whether it's dollars or people, they're already overloaded. It's like me if I'm doing two jobs, already and you want me to start exercising and you want me to start eating healthier and get a new master's degree, it's not gonna happen. 
So that's the basic challenge when you talk about an incumbent who's looking at an Amazon or who's looking at an Uber and says, what does it mean to my business? Uh, technology, I don't think, is the limiting factor. It's all the other cultural issues, which is everything that's difficult in making any big change which is largely there's a resource constraint and there's a lot of vested interests in not changing. 